covered this ground. I'm going to open with questions and answers from the local church here first, and then we'll look into those online. Uh, on questions and answers on predestination, uh, pre existence, foreknowledge, and the topic that we covered uh, based on those areas. Uh, and I believe we might have uh, microphones for you so that uh, those online can also hear you. So I know that some of you already got questions. You may ask uh, the questions. Uh, yes. Test, test. A bit louder, thank you. Speak Hello. a bit louder. Okay. Yes, we can hear. Okay, Pastor. Um, okay, after we have learned about predestination, how do we move into knowing our predestination, our so-called the, the life that we had okay. before the foundation or before the foundation of the world? Okay. The spirit form of... Um, Good question. And uh, let me bring the chart out that we are drawn. Uh, and... Um, Okay, let's search for that. Ah, this is the one we had today, right? Yes. Okay. Now, we have... Oops, I didn't synchronize. I'm going to synchronize. Should be out there. All right, we must have changed the bulb, it's so clear now. Right, was it the bulb all the time? Yeah, okay. So remember at point one, uh, predestination, then we, we came to earth, and that point one, of course, implied point zero up there. And uh, the book is written. And uh, so we say that at point four, the book might change, at point two, the book might change uh, in all the different areas. One advantage of this end time that God has never given it before to any other people on the earth is in this end time because we are so near to New Jerusalem that God allows some of us in the spirit who have gone to, this is level 2 plus, level 2 minus, uh, at this stage where you walk into level 2. Now I would assume most of us in the top 500 we have walked into level two. We are more or less committed to God. We are sold out for God. We are in this end time move. We are lined up with the events that God has. And we want to be a part of that. And uh, so, uh, at this point, uh, the question is asked, how does all this understanding help us and benefit us? And uh, I would see, let me see, I've got space to do uh, one, two, three. Yes, I might have a little space here. And Hi, good thing. Let me rephrase the question. Okay. Yes. Um, we know that some people they have dreams about their predestination, their Correct. past, whatever. So how do we move into that? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. So the first thing is that God allows you to access your scroll. That is the blessing that God has given in this end time move, and. Uh, that being a part of it, we have seen visions of people going there to get, not only you receive your scroll, you access your scroll. Your spirit man access it, your OS. At the beginning of the series, you talk about OS and, a, and your AS. AS is your avatar self, OS is your original self. And uh, so your scrolls were allowed to be accessed. Remember that before that, no one has access. The access is not given to anyone. But access is now given. Now let's look at the access that was before that in the book of, I'm looking at point one, the access that is there. Uh, and, uh, in the book of Job chapter 33, in Job chapter 33, this is the Old Testament first. Job chapter 33. Uh, this is the condition that exists for all mankind. All mankind. And uh, you don't have to be part of the glory church or exactly this is part of God's compassion and mercy. And it says, uh, in verse 14, and I read it together with you now that it's so clear up there. And it says, For God may speak in one way or in another, yet man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, 
when deep sleep falls upon men when slumbering on their beds. He opens the ears of men and seals their instruction in order to turn men from his deed and conceal pride from men. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. In other words, God revealed his perfect will uh, of events to come. You see that happening in even a person who is not necessarily a bad guy, but not necessarily a good guy either. Remember Pharaoh. Who was the one who had the dream? Pharaoh. And it was an important dream because that dream will affect the whole planet. And the mercy of God is anything that affects the whole planet, he showed to speak to people. And uh, he spoke to Pharaoh. Uh, the only thing is, Pharaoh didn't get a message. He saw the dream of the seven fat cows and 17 cows, seven uh, fat yield uh, uh, of uh, wheat, uh, and then 17 ones. But he didn't understand what it meant. It took a man of God, Joseph, to come and say, this is what it means, and to apply it. So this is Old Testament. Also in the Old Testament, remember that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. In the dream, uh, before he had a dream, he was, he was already king of the empires, a king of, king of the world. So he was wondering, what will become of the world after he go off? Which, you know, they wonder how long his kingdom is going to last and what's going to happen. Then he has this dream of the, of the big statue, the golden statue, and, all that, and represent the four empires. But he neither remembered the dream, see sometimes we dream, dream before God, and neither could he interpret. And he asked all his wise men, none of them could, could recall it. Daniel was a man. And Daniel could access the scroll and interpret it for him. So we do see that this is for everyone, including Christians. Except Christians as more. This was what we call level one. Level one. Level one access to the scroll. So God does give people access to their scroll, especially if, if there are certain things that God wants to direct the planet, the earth, and especially when they line up with the events of God. And Pharaoh was an important part of the play. So it's revealed to Pharaoh. Joseph was an important play in the event that was going to affect the whole world. Because through Joseph, he saved the chosen people. So where the events and the people match, it was specially Revealed by God. That's cool. Now, the method of the revelation. Dreams, visions, spoken word. Uh, that one can be different methods. But the fact is, there was revelation. Now, look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we are told, when the Holy Spirit came down, and to fulfill the prophecy of, of Joel, it says, only in these last days. Can you see that? Last days? The last days began in the church age. Because the church age began the search for the bride of Christ. The Old Testament are part of it, but they cannot be perfect without the new. Uh, so the search for the bride. The bride began to make its presence known on the earth. And isn't it true? In 2,000 years, Christianity has spread throughout the world. The bride has made its presence known. But now, not just spreading, now the bride has a growing glory, which is, we are part of this move. The bride has a growing in glory. Many of us have been to different churches we have more or less progressed through different churches. We have all been born again, charismatic, gone to this message and that message, a different structured church, and here we are finally, and we believe we are into this final move and we want to be part of that move. These are the last days. And the difference is, we are the end days, the end of the last days. That throughout all these days, God promised this. He will pour out His Spirit. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So, direction can come from prophecy. See, sometimes God can prophesy over you. Like uh, Timothy, he found one of his cruel understanding in the fact that God called him to be evangelist. 
Paul says that when I lay my hands on you, the Spirit of God came upon you. Uh, so sometimes it's through prophecy. Remember Acts 13, verse 1 and 2. Paul was always an apostle. But during a prayer time, a prophecy came forth. Separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work which I call them to be. And so Paul and Barnabas were separated. And here's the thing. Paul one we know, he's so unique. Barnabas, who would expect him? Who would expect that Barnabas would become an apostle? He was always pastoral. But he says, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work which I called them to. This is found in Acts 13, verse 1 and 2. So I'm just quoting you the Bible. And so God does reveal through prophecy, or sometimes visions, dreams, and all my men servant made servants they Paul is it? and again prophesy. Uh, so all this, this is what I call second level dream. So God will reveal your scroll at a second level. Then we have another level that is there in the Gospel of John. So let's look at the Gospel of John. Chapter, uh, let's look at chapter 16 first. John, Gospel of John. And it says here in John chapter 16, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He will tell you, and here's the thing, things to come. And here it applies in both ways. It applies future events, but he implies, because this is a personal message, your own future, personal future. Jesus, our Lord and our Master, promised to reveal to us our future. So my answer to that question, claim this promise. Jesus said He will show you your future. And you know how good our Lord Jesus is? When He speaks a word, He already takes care of the end times. He knew what was going to happen in our end times. And He expects that there will time come when a group of people will understand what He said. Throughout 2,000 years of Christianity, you think we have understood everything Jesus said? No. We discover things about Jesus. They, they didn't discover a lot of things until as the time, time, end time come. How many people at the, at the beginning of Christianity, in the middle of Christianity, even thousand years ago or so, claim John 14 verse 12, which is the works that I do, you will do also, and greater works than this shall he do. No, nobody claimed that. It has been there for 2,000 years, nobody claimed. Because our eyes were not open yet. But in this end time, we know we're going to do the works of Jesus. In fact, uh, I'm going to be transported very often. So the day will come when no need to take airlines. Hallelujah. And then I can impart to you some of those gifting and say, okay, all of you, you know, join together. You're all right? You're ready to travel? All your bags are packed, everything. Don't leave your luggage behind. And all right, okay, we're about to go. All right, here goes. Shoom, and all we go. So uh, that would be nice. And so... Uh, there's a time coming. These are the works of Jesus, greater works of Jesus. We saw when Jesus was on earth that he transported himself many, many times. And you get a few occasions when you could almost, almost see it. Like uh, when he come the storm, pew, they were right there. And then sometimes Jesus sent them across and said, I will meet you across. None of them seemed surprised. It's like they used to, no, he disappeared and appeared. Remember the same thing of Elijah. They're so used to it. So he was a type of Elijah. They were expecting it uh, all the time, that Jesus could transport himself. Uh, and the works that he do, we do greater works, plus all the signs and wonders, the healing, the lame, the raising the dead, and all these other things, a part of it. See, no generation has claimed that so much. But here's the thing. Where in church history, do you read of a group of people whom God said to them, you will do the signs and wonders of Moses? None. 
Remember, I read church history, you know, uh, ferociously. That means backwards and forwards. I know church history quite thoroughly. I study it quite a lot. And many men of God. None of them had that word. We have that word. Because we are in the end of days. And that is part of our scrolls. Part of the scroll of the end time that he has. And that has to do also with Matthew chapter 25, when the voice that cried at midnight wake everybody up. And then everybody realized, hey, you know, we were asleep before. Yes, we were asleep before. The last seven times, seven years, we are finally awake. Our eyes are open. And we see things that we could not have before. So, as Jesus claim this verse, and this is for believers. And like all the things of Jesus, you must ask for it. You must desire for it. And uh, I don't know, I can say sorry for it. I can say hallelujah for it. You must fast and pray for it. Then it can come. See, God separates those who hunger for Him from those who do not. Uh, one day, when all this is common, then everybody else want to come in. By that time, all the positions of the top 500 are already taken. So he has this, uh, the advantage, like the question asked is, okay, how do we apply that? Don't worry about the methodology or how it takes place. But it is our blessing now that in no other generation, to no other group of people, has God been so desirous to reveal your personal scroll? Because God wants to reveal to you how you fit in New Jerusalem in these end times. It is a privilege for some people, like Aruel, he saw his, where his name is in New Jerusalem. So every one of us can have that. But when one person sees, it can spark the others. I believe Israel saw it, then after Jehuda also saw it, and different people saw uh, the different corners, and then I have a bit all the other corners and saw different names. And uh, then for the first generation with the four faces, uh, you already know where, where it was, and I saw, I looked look inside for you, and I saw that your names were in the foundation of the corner. Yeah, so that's not bad. Every one of us have a place and a name. So it is... In, back to this place here. We are all at level 3 and level 4 of this area where God reveals to us uh, our position and our place. It does not come overnight, uh, but sometimes in the day after many times of waiting on God, God reveals. It took me some time to discover who I am. From the early days, I knew I was called to the ministry, right? That's general. But you must be obedient to the first step. And when I went into the ministry, through time, uh, I understood that I was always an apostle. And even though I was, a, you know, pastoral work, I knew where I was. But because I was so good at teaching, people always think I'm only a teacher, they don't realize that the teaching that came forth was not just a normal teacher. It's apostolic teaching, foundational teaching. So people tend to limit you. I remember when I first called uh, to the ministry in my first church, because I used traveling ministry, and then um, when I was uh, planting one of the, my first church, it was Cathedral of Glory, uh, second church, uh, Cathedral of Glory, and then there was an uh, uh, elderly lady who always wear white color. She was Indian, and very, very nice lady. I don't know where she's still alive. Uh, she used to come and go, always wear white, and one of the very uh, spiritual ladies. So one day in a phone call, she says, you know, um, I don't think you're a pastor. So I said, you know, why do you think so? And, it says, uh, and she says, uh, she says this. She, she, meant, she meant good. She meant well. She says, my ministry belongs to the world, not just one church. And uh, that's what means she means. So I say, no, but you have, to, you have to prove yourself in one place first and establish it. Because one of the differences is sometimes people speak from their, their knowledge. She had no idea that I've been in travel. She, she knew I was in traveling ministry, but she don't know that I'm very analytical. 
I had been travelling in a travelling ministry for many years before I started a church and I knew that when you, when you go to a church or any place to minister, you're limited by the local leaders. They might tell you not to preach this, not to preach that, don't offend this, not to offend that. And you're always half-pleasing men, half-pleasing the Lord. Because uh, you, you cannot push away all around because you also come in submission to them. So then I realised, wow, very difficult to push even from the outside because you don't have the freedom to do what you want. And uh, you, you, you do it a little bit at a time hoping people will change. And I've been out there, I've been analysing, okay, I don't think this move will succeed just from the outside trying to change people because everyone got their right and, and each one have their own kingdom in their own church and their own ministry. And then I realised, you must have your own church to show it. Then got freedom to design, to structure the church any way I want and show people this is how you can run a church, this is how you can work a church, this is how you can have five-fold in a church. And I did. So I established a church with five-fold ministries. And I show it can be done. And then, as, then people won't pay attention to you until you're in the thousands. Uh, so by the time we reach a thousand strong and we begin to influence a lot of people, every one of them was looking. Okay, that is possible. And we got so many followers. We, got, we started the FCM, Fellowship of Catholic Ministries, where we have a lot of people from Southeast Asia and even from all the West that come and follow our ministry. Then they come under the ministry. So it's size that affects people. Uh, when you're small, that's fine. But one thing people forgot, every big thing starts small. Every big thing starts small. And then you wait for the time when God gives you the fame and the favor and boom, that's it. Do you know how fast it is? All God needs is to just give me one big giant open door. That's it. It can be overnight. And, uh, because we already got the material. We already got the content. It is just like a good company, you know, in a business, you've got a lot of good companies to develop, develop things. And then, if you develop things quite solid, all you need is the opportunity for your product to get in. When people taste your product, they say, where do you get this product? And then the whole world wants, that's it. But if you've got no product, of course, open doors are useless for you. Right. So, it's important for us to understand, everything is based on God's timing. But the world will only pay attention when you're sizable. That's the world's way. And, uh, so we realized that, uh, then she told me, oh no, you're not, you're not really a pastor. She's wrong, very wrong. But she meant well. I have never allowed people to limit me based on what they say. You must always find out who you are yourself. It took me another four or five years, and then I understood. When our church was growing to about a thousand, I realized. I have three, I used to tell people, you hear my old tapes, I stand in three offices, apostle, evangelist, and teacher, or teacher and evangelist. And then, through time, after I became Johann Melchizedek Peter, I was very reluctant. You, you must know me, I'm the type who don't like to, you know, don't like to stand out there, kind of thing. Although I, I need to stand there to be a leader, but I don't enjoy fame. I don't enjoy popularity. I like to be anonymous. I like to, you know, let Jesus take all the glory. And uh, so I, I don't really like to be out there. Uh, but I have to because it's part of the job. And so, uh, after beginning Johan Marquette, Peter, God, God, Jesus began to show me things in heaven and all those things. And uh, then I realized that I'm actually called to f all five, five-fold ministry exactly like Jesus who stood on the five-fold. I said, wow, how to tell people when they say very proud. You know, we say, where, where can, how can? Then I realized, as the end time progressed, I was not the only one. That all the twelves, the thirties, and some of the five hundred stand in five offices. A possibility that was never there before. Never in Christianity. So suddenly I realized, okay, there is, uh, you know, the, there is more to the things of God. But as I show you in my life, it progresses. Now I know who I am. And uh, more and more as I accept the role. Remember, I, in this series, I taught three things. I mentioned three things. You must know your predestination. You must accept it. And then you must f do f work it out, finish. Accepting is not as easy as as you think. 
Even though God show you something to accept it, it's not easy. You know, when God showed that I was uh, the place, I uh, uh, remember the, the disciples said want to be right hand, left hand, left hand. Then God says, actually that is me. I say, ah. You know, you think that I take like, whoa, no, no. I, I was like, ah, you, you're sure, you know, that, that's a very important place, oh Lord. But it took a few other revelations, like Jehuda saw it, and then the era on some of the other things. Then it slowly pushed me and said, okay, la, I accept, kind of thing. You know, and then it took, but once I accept it, there was a change. So it takes time to accept some of the callings of God, change of God. And to accept that I'm the voice that cried at midnight. And uh, then to accept that I was the one prophesied, that the man from the east that would rise. And uh, so uh, to accept that is not easy. It's not as easy as John the Baptist to accept that he was a voice that cried in the wilderness. Uh, not so easy uh, as you think. But once you accept it, it's different. So to the question that was raised, firstly, you can access the scroll. Once you access the scroll, and whatever portion, no matter how humble or how great, like God might show that you might be one of those chosen to win 10 million souls. You might say, wow, you know, I haven't even won half a soul. <laughs> right? And people, you talk about it, people don't believe you. And remember, we're going to win two-thirds of the population of the earth. So all these people will be under us training to win millions of souls. And, um, and it is to accept it. To accept that really that was God's will for you. You might struggle, you might doubt, and every time you got a revelation, the devil will come and try to make you doubt. Sometimes he sends people, he sends human beings along the way. In the early days when people don't believe that I was a pastor and have a pastoral call, you know, they always say, they want to limit me, make me just a teacher. Uh, but then when I look back, I say, I do more pastoral things than a lot of pastors. So by your actions and the fruit, you prove that you're a pastor. Uh, and uh, Not necessarily what people think. But that in those days, my teaching ministry was so strong that people could not see the pastoral gift. But if I had not been teaching so strongly, people could have seen the pastoral gift. And uh, people like to limit you all the time. But in the end, you have to be who you are, know who God asks you to be. And uh, just follow the calling that God has. So to accept it, is another area. Like God might reveal to you, wow, you're the, one of those end-time business people to bring in, you know, uh, billions of dollars into the kingdom of God. You might say, wow, kind of thing. And here's the thing, unless you accept it, it never happen. Like, obviously the way I talk, I accept the fact that we're going to win two, two-thirds of the population of the earth, which is roughly six billion souls. Long ago, people talk about 1 million like a lot, 10 million like a lot. Now we talk 1 billion like kacang putih. Right? Because we're so used to it, our faith level has risen. And uh, the claim, 6 billion souls. And, but to accept it takes time, takes growth. Uh, we might question it, examine it, check whether it's the word of God. Of course, don't after this, every Tom Dick and Harry claim everything under the sun. Right? So... Uh, we cannot, you can only accept what the revelation and the rhema comes to you. Faith does not come from your own presumption. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the rhema of God. God must speak first, then we can become. So listen to God's word. And once the scrolls are revealed to you, uh, second thing is to accept. Then you think accepting uh, is, is, is uh, already not so easy. The last one, uh, is to complete or finish the work. Like Jesus said, I finish the work. Finishing it takes a price. Costly. You might have to take the step of faith where you burn all your bridges and only keep walking in the front. It will cost you everything to do God's will. What did it cost Jesus? Everything. What did it cost Peter? in the New Testament, everything. What did it cost Abraham? Everything. What did it cost uh, Paul? 
everything. Have you noticed one thing about the men and women in the Bible? It cost them everything to follow God. That is why not everybody also finished three. Let me tell you that. Some people only accept some part of their calling. So some of their other calling given to others because they don't accept it. God only has a window of time. When Elijah went to find Elisha, Elisha had to accept it. If Elisha reject it, he will find someone else. When the Gabriel, the archangel, appeared to Mary and says, you're highly favored. If Mary says, no way, Jose! You know, angel disappears. Shoot, shoot, go to somebody else. We have to accept it. And sometimes you have more than one row, one call. You have to accept it. Uh, something to do with your internal, your, your faith, your acceptance. When you accept it, then you have to work out how to finish it. How to do the work. And I can guarantee it will cost you everything. It will cost you everything. No one in the Bible and no one today can do what God wants you to do among the top 500 without laying your whole life on the line. You have to walk on water to get across. Some of you say, Oh, I cannot lie. I'm kya su, kya 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 si. No problem. Stay in the boat. And follow later. But you're going to be top 500. Walk on water. But please examine whether God has spoken. If He has, be like Abraham. Follow along. And He will lead you and guide you. So these are the three answers to what shall we do, how we benefit, the mechanics of it. Yes, one question, let's come from this side. I know Collins Dictionary and Bin Lan has a lot of questions. A whole list of them. Yeah. Okay, that's why I, I, that's why I didn't do teaching. I use this for the teaching for the local church first before we open. Okay, uh, so Pastor, uh, in terms of like point four, uh, God's intervention, and we ah, know that yeah. uh, also God will intervene in uh, various areas. Yeah. Um, I find that God is intervening even uh, in terms of revealing the scrolls. In, in the sense that what you know changes how you respond. And God also has foreknowledge of how we respond. Yes. So this whole thing makes it quite complicated for us to really grabs the significance because by we have to go through the trials we have yes. to go through the testing knowing the end result does encourage us does spur us on but also knowing that what comes out in the a test whether you, you, you know how much of it also makes you um, you know more challenging or less challenging um, so I I'm not sure how I'm going to phrase this. Uh, the question hasn't come out yet. You just <laughs> lay the foundation. Yes. <laughs> Waiting for the question. No, I think this one is messed up. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know how to ask this, uh, this question. It's just that, um, for example, I mean, uh, uh, Jesus uh, came to take all our, our pain and sorrows, but and yet, you know, God has also predestined us to go through uh, the pain, the testing, the tribulations, in order to fulfill His destiny for us. Um, so, still, still no, no question on this. Maybe I cannot ask this. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to f feel the question. Okay. So the question is, are you asking about how much free will is involved with God's powerful foreknowledge? Uh, no, it's just that I think uh, uh, I'm feeling that there's a lot of uh, uh, suffering and uh, uh, I want to have more joy of the Lord, but uh, personally I'm... <laughs> uh, Yes. Afraid of asking more because each more is more suffering. 
Uh, no, no, no. That one I can't. Uh, just now I, I came to a conclusion that uh, if, 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 if I uh, go the other direction, I also suffer. If yes. I go with God, I also suffer. So I so go with God. Yes, suffer, absolutely. Good reasoning. And, uh, uh, you know, get get uh, uh, the blessings get at the end of suffering. The other side is the lake of fire. Yes. <laughs> so I guess maybe I don't ask this this question. Um, Pastor, maybe I ask a question regarding uh, babies uh, going to um, babies. Uh, yeah, babies okay. when they die. So they go to heaven. Yes. Um, these but do they straight away go to can they enter new heaven and new earth? Because they never go through test trials and so on. So ah, they never tested. Good point there. Uh, for the babies that die between point one and two, uh, and do they go into uh, new heaven and new Jerusalem? Yes, because they're part of the human race. But do they belong to the Romans 2 category? Or? Uh, they, once you come into here, uh, they are still under what I call under the grace period. Mm. So all humans, according to First Timothy chapter two, are destined for here. Remember, the original plan is every single human being, from Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve didn't fall, was destined for here. Not a single one left out. And that implies that children, both of those who are non-Christians, who are safe and of Christians, still get it here because they haven't reached the age of accountability. So who are the people that are outside the New Jerusalem? Uh, that yet they are safe and you know, they, they are not in hell, but yet they cannot enter. Ah, they are two groups of them. One is those who have... Um, uh, in a way, I can not say reject, but some awareness of Jesus, but didn't want to be part of Jesus. And uh, then there are those who never had a chance of Jesus. So they never uh, had a chance to get into this New Jerusalem glory. Uh, example, when God deal with Abraham, what about the other nations of the world that exist in Abraham's time? Uh, it was not God's time to begin to pick the cream of the cream. So it seems like the human race must go on their own way first. Then when it's ripe, God starts looking. So the human race reached a point in Abraham's time when God started looking. Uh, and uh, Then God started harvesting a group of people. God started from Abraham, which means that those who are not in Abraham's covenant are among those outside. You have to have the Abrahamic covenant to come in. Then in the new, you have to have the covenant of Jesus. New Jerusalem is only those covenant. So in the old Abraham covenant, in the new Jesus covenant, those outside the covenant are outside New Jerusalem. They have their place and their role. Yeah, I also try to help some people ask questions. Just now at the, you know, oh, sure. Shopping. Ask for them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they are very shy so, to ask. New heaven, new earth is equivalent to New Jerusalem, right? New heaven, new earth uh, is different. different. New Jerusalem is the capital of new heaven, new earth. Mm -hmm. So the glory is the greatest there. So those like the humans that uh, didn't get into New Jerusalem, they will still be part of new heaven and they can be part of new earth. Uh, according to the measurement of New Jerusalem, it is the size of Australia or of the United States continent. That's how big the city is. So if the earth is the earth, that means there's still a part outside the earth, around. So there could be gardens and all around, and then there are other planets all around. So there's a lot of room for, for the human race who did not make it to still live around. So does it mean that those people with, uh, only with rewards then can go to New Jerusalem? But without rewards, then it's outside New Jerusalem? Ah, then the question of rewards. Uh, as long as even in a non-reward stage, the person is in Christ, can I think? <laughs> in Christ, 
they scrape through, they make it. Maybe their name might be one of the pavement on the one of the roads. <laughs> Still not bad, part of New Jerusalem. Yeah. And maybe I ask some question. The, the babies, uh, when they die, they go to children's paradise and they get trained, right? Yes. Why do they need to get trained? Well, well you know, before that, in pre existence, they already, some of them already have, are trained and then they. they they become babies and they have to start all over again. Is that how it works? Uh, not really. The human race was created specially with creativity. For example, even fallen humans, you remember eating of food only come after the fall. But the human race has made eating a delicious experience. And not only that, Humans in all cultures make their own eating a different style and pleasure. There are probably a thousand and one ways to cook chicken. The, the humble little chicken got cooked a thousand and one ways because of the invention of humans. And then, if Jesus was not coming in 50 years, if we had, let's say, another 1,000 years, some of us might be producing entire nations that will come up with their own language and their own culture and a new way to cook chicken. This is inherent in the human race. And so even babies who go there have this creativity. And you know where our creative artwork and playground is? All of new heaven and new earth. And when we finish doing all our painting there, God creates new universe to do even more creativity. And the thing is, all of them will be unique and having similarities but different fingerprint. Because of the inherent creativity of the human race. If in our fallen state we are so creative, imagine what we are like in our glorified stage. So every child has some creativity that God wants to create. In other words, there's a universe in every one of us. If not, many universes. Okay, Pastor, next question for me. Okay. Uh, we got it all together now. Praise uh, the Lord. This one is a different question. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're still struggling with the first one. Yeah, yeah the one is still cut off. Uh, Okay, we, we see in uh, Revelation uh, 10, verse 5 to 7. Revelation 10, verse 5 to 7, everyone. Yes. Now, there, there's a few things in, in there, but I, I just want to focus on one particular point. Um, there's an angel standing in the sun. That's a different one, okay. Yes, there's a lot of things there. Um, okay, this part about that there should be uh, delay no longer. Uh, so we are we are dealing with the uh, the completion of everything, which is uh, Christ will come back, and there should be delay no longer. Correct. Yeah. All right. And then we look at uh, if we look at this Second uh, Peter uh, yeah. three. Second Peter three. Uh, verse eleven to thirteen. Three verse eleven to thirteen. Yes. Yes. Uh, so we see that. Um, uh, the old heaven and old earth will be dissolved and then uh, uh, we look to uh, the hastening of the coming of the day of the Lord. So, in these two verses uh, or passages, we are talking about the coming of the Lord, the coming of the day. And there is a talk about not delaying anymore and then this one talks about hastening. Yes. So, uh, there seems to be some factors that uh, is in play that affects the, the timeline of God. So does it mean that because these were all uh, prophesied or talked about uh, 2,000 years ago, that um, by now, the timeline is all fixed. But earlier on, uh, the saints of God uh, could have speeded up the coming of Christ or delayed the coming of Christ um, by their responses? Very good question, which we can counter with another sub-answer. 
if Moses had accepted God's proposal to wipe out all the Israelites who freshly came out from Egypt, nearly 3 million, and said, yes, Lord, kill them all. <laughs> Let's start with me and my family, uh, for, uh, with the two kids. How much time do you think would have taken? few more generations at least. Yes, probably might take another uh, 200, 200 years. 200 years. So there will have been 200 years delay to the promise of Abraham going in, uh, uh, children going in. Uh, and so to God, it was a small thing. And it is possible and correct that from the beginning of the church age, that there could be a delay in different things. Even in when we start the count, when, when the glory came at Pergamos, the timeline is sealed. From February the 9th, 2012. From then, the timeline is sealed. And only the humans involved. And if the humans involved do not flow along, God has to work very quickly. In fact, uh, the angels have to keep rearranging things, not the events, things regarding the humans. Because even from March to now, there are different humans involved in different things. A lot of the things in New Jerusalem and the things in heaven have been taken away from some and replaced by others. The moment they are replaced by September this year, there is no more going forward. And I repeat, there are some who during this time of testing have lost their salvation. They will not even be in new heaven. They will be in a lake of fire. And they belong there. In time, I will reveal it. But that's how serious. The seriousness is this. You can reject the word of God. You can because it's a free will. You can, um, uh, what I call, take Gamaliel's stand, or you can reject. But if you call a man of God evil, you are close to blaspheming the Holy Spirit. To humans, it is not um, what I call you uh, know, not so serious because after all, a man is a man. But it depends. If they call the man of God or the work of the man of God evil, it is same like they call Jesus Beelzebub. They can call the man of God, ah, you sinner. No, maybe he is not, but they are throwing human accusation. Or they might call, you're not perfect. Fine. They might call, hey, I don't believe in you. Fine. Hey, I know your brothers, your sisters. No problem. But to call someone evil is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. We have not enough teaching on that. Now, Ananias and Sapphira are also in the lake of fire. They are not saved. Their sin is not... Uh, a lot of Christians today have seen the same sin. But the difference is the glory of God manifests. There were several factors. Number one, there is the basic teaching that you cannot call the work of the Spirit the work of the devil or evil. To call something evil is to actually say you are the devil. Isn't it right? It's the same as calling you the devil. Except we try to phrase it in a human diplomatic way. You are evil, kind of thing. Uh, so it depends on who we call evil. You can call any Tom, Dick, and Harry evil. But if you call the messenger of God evil, different. If you say, oh, the messenger of God is not perfect, that's different. You still haven't sinned. So, in terms of um, the area of. Uh, uh, the level of sin that is there, that has changed some things. The angels have to rearrange because the very places in New Jerusalem has changed. 
very places that are reserved specially have changed because some have gone in the lake of fire. We will find that out soon. And then, um, because of these changes, and then there are some things God wants to speed up still. Because He's got His timeline. And then in recent downloads, God still keep to the timeline. And as a result, some of the timeline that even in some of the downloads, like even today, like Janet is receiving, I explained to her what it means. Some of the angels have to take the role, like behaving like the humans were supposed to take the role. Almost like Melchizedek taking the place of Adam. In the spiritual world, at least, they have to function like that in order to release the energy that need to be released in this end time because the timeline has been fixed and the only delay is the humans who delay themselves and God only got a window of time if they don't get in in time God will just quickly use somebody else uh, but some things because I've got compassion the, door, the, 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 the work hasn't been taken the angels have to do extra work to, to do their part to energize all the OS or, or the original spirit beings who are neither angels nor what but the original part of our, uh, our beings have to do come and do extra work our OS suddenly got more involved and um, uh, my OS uh, that is split into male and female has to combine with one of the angels from the pristine universe in order to continue the work that needs to be done to energize some things because already like, like already they come and then supposed to be bind with a human being the human being not there so now the angel that come has to bind with the OS to release some things a lot of strange interesting things are happening in heaven but if I describe them you know it's just like Paul said um, there are a lot of things that, that words cannot describe what's happening. But in answering question, I give little clues to what is happening in the spirit. And uh, yes, in, in answer to your question, yes. Uh, long ago when this began, the day in the coming of the Lord was like rubber band, depending on how the church comes. But once the Lord has established the voice that cry at midnight, it is midnight. Once the midnight hour has come, timeline. And so once I found my place, everything else has to take order. So you either line up, you don't line up. You don't believe, then don't line up. You believe, line up. Then you don't believe someone will take your place, line up. So you know how when we line up as a soldier, you need the first line, correct? And the symbolic was very great. On March the 18th, uh, when I graduate and receive my doctorate from the Australian Catholic University, you know who was first in line? Me. There was a prophetic message even when I was all alone there. And so, you know, in a university, when they give the thing, uh, and the dean or all that give the thing, uh, you have a list of students. So the PhD students always come first. So, but they were about, I think there were about eight or eight or ten PhD students. And of all of them, I was the first one. So being the first one was also important because the path that I take, I, uh, the rest have to follow. That means after you receive this, you go where and all that. And then when I look at the diagram and the actual place, I say, hey, something is blocking the path. And then the, one of the deans in charge went and said, Oh yeah, that's right. So I say, I cannot follow this because that one, there is the, some big uh, symbolic thing blocking. So he said, it's alright, you take the other route. So when I did that, every other student take the other route. So when we have a march and a roll call, usually uh, when the, the main soldier has found their place, all the rest must take their place in line. It means you're not in line, you're not part of it. And, uh, so at this stage in the revival, like I say, it's too late to stop it. Already people have lined up for it. Already we have sold out the timeline, we have announced things. 
And once it's released, it's been sealed, sealed, sealed. Don't know how many seals really. That we may see. At each seal, something was dry cement. And so at this time in the revival, your answer is correct and your question is correct. That the events have been fixed. The time is 2063 and, uh, to the rapture and uh, 2000, another uh, seven odd years, 2069, 670 to the end of the days of Jesus' second coming. And then the millennium takes place. So that has all been fixed, including the seven times seven years, including Satan last year was born. So nothing now can change the timeline. Only the humans involved, whether you're going to be part of it and which part of it is changeable. So, Pastor, following this principle of uh, hastening uh, because of our actions, it means also that uh, we are destined to receive the new Jerusalem glory at some stage, uh, the powers of the age to come. Yes. It also means that if we respond correctly, the plus two can be plus three or... Yes, can be plus three, plus four. In the hastening, there is some of this hastening, we can bring forward um, some of the things, like for example, the, the, the miracles, uh, yes. the creative miracles were in part brought forward on our responses as well, right? Correct. So, yeah. Some events can be... Uh, the blessing of those events can be brought forward. The powers of the age to come. Good question. Yes. Hello, Pastor. Ah, we got one mic for this side. Ah, she asked. Uh, uh, you're going to ask? Okay, we get her, then get to you, or whichever. Yeah, she raised her hand first. Uh, Pastor, I want to ask where is. Or all the pristine zone, because I pristine where? zone. Christian zone. Pristine. Oh, where is the pristine zone? Okay. I know some from the message, but I was thinking other is there other countries? Uh, they are, uh, yeah. uh, except the most complete pristine zone is the whole country of Australia. Unfortunately, that has not been sealed fully yet. And that needs to be hastened, and God only give a certain time. Uh, I don't think it will be that long either. And then parts of South America, parts of uh, Canada, and uh, parts of Africa, and parts of um, uh, the hinterland of Russia, Europe, that side. Uh, these are the major ones. Then there are pockets of it all over. And the pristine zone needs to be determined because of the mini Noah climate, uh, uh, disaster that is coming in 2029. So they, will, they are, and we will identify them. Yes. Yeah, okay, because I'm looking into the business where to <laughs> build factory or yes. plantation. I don't want to do at a place that is not in the pristine zone. Understood. We will let you know. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, yesterday or two days, two days ago, Ariel has a vision where he saw uh, the angels of the ten churches, uh, ten men churches, uh, have already got their spirit beings and they combine with the pristine angels now to start to create the pristine zone. And uh, so they're waiting, they're really waiting for the pristine zones to be released. And uh, uh, Human beings are behind time in that. Yes. We will, as soon as you know that, we will let you know. Already among our leaders, I already told them, from the test, I already absolute which leaders are where. So some of our leaders stand, because we're building an empire of the Lord Jesus. So some leaders fall in the category of policy makers. Some are the executive uh, leaders. So we've got different types of leaders for different things. Uh, and uh, of course, the intercessors in our special group. Uh, and, uh, so they are, then the, the worship and all those different groups. So like King David, we are dividing the teams into different specialties. Yeah. Pastor. Uh, yes, Jedutel. Okay, um, just now you mentioned about uh, Abraham, uh, Abrahamic covenant. Those who are not in Abrahamic covenant, um, they will not have a chance of going to New, New Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Correct. Uh, does that sound very unfair? 
I mean, uh, <laughs> they, they may not even be safe in the first place because they are in other countries, so to speak. Yes. So um, that's a very common question that people ask. Uh, how about these people? Are they safe? Yeah. If they are not safe, then isn't it very unfair? They haven't heard. That they are them. safe. Oh, they are safe. They are safe. They are under Romans 2 category. Okay. Uh, by the Father's mercy, they are safe. And, um, that, that's based on their conscience. If same based on the conscience, okay. yes. So they will be in uh, some place. Uh, yes, there will be some place in the new heaven and the new earth, but not in New Jerusalem. Uh, okay. NHNE, but not NJ. <laughs> so for those in ND, NJ, they got both NHNE. Uh, this, hey, this sounds like the bird flu virus, uh, right? But it's the good part. <laughs> okay. Now, on the unfair side, I need to say something. Um, the human race as a group progress together. Uh, and so sometimes it takes a long time for the human race to come forth. But usually God waits until the first. When God was looking for someone in Abraham's time, he could not find anyone except Abraham. If he found one among the Chinese, then the Jews today would have been Chinese. If he had found one among the Indians, then the Israelite, the true Israelite, would have been Indians. And so when God looked, he had to look at the hearts of men. And when God was looking, he said, whoever. Unfortunately, God was also looking for only one man. And that one man changed everything underneath him. And uh, uh, remember, there's such a thing called the fullness of time. Uh, and so the human race was, it takes so much of the human race to produce those things. Here's another revelation that I have that I seldom thought on. No matter how we choose, no matter what we choose, we will always end up a mathematical formula. Very strange. We will always end up a mathematical formula. In our, that means, in other words, we are not that big. Uh, as a general, like for example, you know chaos theory. When you look at the deserts from the top, don't you see beautiful patterns? But nobody designed the pattern. The wind just blow here, blow there, blow there. Now, no matter how it blow, it will produce those dunes. Beautiful dunes. Every molecule of sand is forced into the picture. Because of the way creative force works, I call that, call that a quantum law. Quantum law says this, that whenever something or energy flows, it will produce a pattern. So if quantum law applies to free will and the human race, it will produce a pattern. So if you, if you like take uh, four people and let them spend a thousand years, after a thousand years, the quantum law will show that they will produce business people, they will produce rulers, they will produce scholars, they will produce workmen, and so they will end up with the same thing, even though they might have a different culture and all that. Because of how the necessity of those things work in social terms. Isn't it strange that in every country you go, there is the word called police, but spelled in a different way? Why every country need police? Soldier, different. Why every country need even uh, theocracy or, or, or monarchy and all those things? Because in the end, that's the most optimum way to do something. Okay, let's say an example. If we all separate and no one invent the aeroplane. And let's say 100 countries invent the aeroplane. You know what? No matter how they do, the aeroplane will still look the same. Roughly the same. It will have two wings because it takes two wings to fly. It will need an engine because it needs a force to propel it. Whether it's a propeller engine or a jet engine. It will need wheels because it needs to land. Or maybe floats to land on the water. But 100 countries can invent the aeroplane and they will still end up roughly looking the same. Because we work on the same laws of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics 
says, this is what it takes to fly a plane. We might make it different size, different shape, wings, different, different area, but roughly when you look, it's all the same. Why does a rocket look the same, whether it's invented by the Germans or the Americans or the, or the Koreans or the, or the Japanese or the Irans or the Indians? Why? Because you need that shape to pass through the, the, the sound barrier, resistance, to shoot it up against the law of gravity. They might be slightly different, like they might have three engine rocket, single engine rocket, but still look like a rocket. A rocket is a rocket, is a rocket. Because there's certain laws. And, uh, so we humans, we work with two eyes, two hands, and no matter what we invent, it will still need to operate with ten fingers. Because that is our basic quantum using ten fingers. But if there was an alien with twenty fingers, then obviously when they invent a piano, they can play 20 fingers. I remember it was Mozart who one day wrote a piece of music that need 11 fingers. Even then someone play, how? I cannot play this note. Then he says, I'll show you how. Kung with the nose. <laughs> the 11 finger. So, because we got 10 fingers, you can write notes for one to 10, but never 12, 13, 14, because we're limited by 10 fingers. And so there's a certain quantum that causes us to produce things in a certain dimension. Uh, that's interesting. Like for example, music. Every culture has music. But all music roughly falls in the same category, even if it sounds different. And the vibrations are the same. C on every place is still C. The difference is, the Western music have half tone, semitone, and the Chinese music got quarter tones. That's why you hear ding, 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 okay? they the little quarter tones that they don't use. But basically, we still use the same vibrations. There's a certain quantum that is there. And so at the end of the day, mathematics rule the day. Because we're all energy. And the energy flows through us. Intellectual energy, emotional energy, and different energies. And the energy, all energies will flow by quantum laws. And as a result, all become maths. Which is why I say, if you leave a group of people and give them free choice, roughly one third will rebel. Because one third is connected to pi. That's why you got one third angels rebellion. It's almost they say, hey, did they have free choice or were they mathematics? Both. Yeah. Uh, so, yes. so this is actually the design of the universe, the design of the laws of the universe that the Lord has put around. Correct. So it's in a way actually like the DNA of the universe. Yes. And uh, we also are given DNA, physical DNA, soul DNA, and also there's a spiritual DNA that you talk about. So our spiritual DNA actually now uh, limits us to be able to do certain things. Like also, uh, you can have only 10 fingers to play uh, a certain piece. But when we move into New Jerusalem, our DNA changes. <laughs> 11 laws, fingers. <laughs> the, Just the laughing laws, now. Okay. The, the, laws, the spiritual laws are a different set of mathematical laws. Already. Yes. It's a higher spiritual It's a higher. We are not limited to the physical. So, in, in downloads, uh, is there things that you can share that in the new Jerusalem, us, as the new species? Do we still look the same? Uh, no, I, I'm probably the look is not really that of a concern, but uh, what are the things that could um, be different? Okay. On this earth, we are very dependent on our physical energy and on uh, the way we express our emotional and intellectual and real energy. In the dimension of the spirit, you know how like uh, the Eskimo got maybe 8 to 10 words for snow, right? There are about a zillion words for thoughts. There are various shades of thoughts that we have no idea of. And each thought is a creative thing. 
Because in the depths of God, thought is energy. But on this earth, thought is like just one form of energy. But actually, inside thoughts is a whole spectrum of energy, which are more finely refined than we could express. There are different thoughts or forms of thought energy. So that in the higher dimension of God, when it's combined with God, uh, just a logos. What is a logos? A logos exists before the rhema. Just a logos is itself a universe. So I need not sit on the piano and play the piano in heaven. I could conceive of the entire range of an orchestra. And by conceiving it, it's equal to playing it. And it's as if I'm playing all these instruments at the same time. And think about it this way. Let's say we have mind over matter. Let's say. How much of that mind over matter can you use? Does it mean that it's singular? That means you can only do one thing at one time with your thought, correct? Could it mean that with one thought I could control all the pianos in the world? Or... With that one thought, could I control every instrument in the world to play C? An interesting thought. <laughs> right? So we don't know the power of thoughts. And the power of thoughts is actually the essence of the universe. It's original logos that is there. And that's why we came into this earth to understand the preciousness of it after coming here. See, from heaven perspective, the power of the hands and the feet is almost like a nothing. And the only way to understand its value is to come down to the earth here. Then we understand the value of one finger. <laughs> Because to them, all physical matter is just easy to create. Imagine living in a world of thoughts and we exist, let's say, as a type of energy being only using thoughts. Would we as energy being appreciate shape and form? No. To us, these are tools. We could use any shape and form. Then by coming here, suddenly we are so limited and thought is only one energy. But shape and form is very important. One finger is very important. And then we, we see the value of this opposite side. So that's why we have to come here because when you learn this side, then you can go back and learn higher on the opposite side without losing your touch of reality. So we can only progress so much in heaven. But to go higher, if we go higher without progressing here, we will lose touch with the reality of this dimension. In order not to lose that, we have to come down, join with it, and then go back. So, like I said, uh, Newton's law. With every force is the opposite and opposite force. So, if you throw some, if you're not held by the ground, if I throw a ball at 10 miles per hour, I will float away at 10 miles per hour. Because as it leaves me, I'm pushed the opposite side. Only friction holds me down. Or air pressure that holds me down. And that's how rockets work. Rockets don't actually push the uh, rocket. Rocket actually escape. It is an escape gas. So if I can make the gas escape at 1,000 kilometers per hour, the rocket will go forward 1,000 because of the law. With every force has the opposite force. And we were not able to go higher in God without losing touch of this reality. If we had tried to go there, we would have like disappeared into it. So there was a limit how to go higher. It's just like you cannot expand this side without expanding that side. So knowing that we've got to expand that side, we came here 
to expand this side. And then when this side is fully established without us falling too far, then it opens a room for unlimited expansion there. And the lowest of where you can go, that's why God allowed, God saw and allowed sin and evil. So this is the closest that you could touch evil. Because we were born in sin. And by coming so low, we can rise so high. It is the law of God. Yes, the question way the back. Yeah. And then we start writing questions on internet, if any. Yes. Okay, um, my first question is um, regarding the US election. You mentioned the candidate would be a so and so person, but then again. Who is that? Okay, the US election. Oh, you US election. Okay, okay, you mentioned election. that the candidate would be a so and so guy. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but that would involve um, influencing the wills of millions of Americans, hundreds of millions, because America is, after all, a democratic system, so to speak. So, um, God doesn't really alter the wills of people, right? How no. do you... Yeah, isn't that contradictory? How, do, how does he win the election if millions of people are to have their own way? Okay, and, uh, to answer that yeah. part, we have to see that the prophecy is based on foreknowledge and not just based on predestination. That means God knows how humans will choose. Okay, okay, I, I understand. Yeah, okay, the second question. Um, sorry, sorry, if so if the... Okay, can I just, uh, uh, can I just counter a question with you? So if the prophecy is based on foreknowledge, yes. and it's based on a combination of predestination and foreknowledge, yeah, in that case, isn't it a, isn't it a coincidence that foreknowledge coincides with predestination? Because in this case, uh, your so-called God has foreknowledge that, okay, this so-and-so will win the election. But it also happens to his will that so-and-so that -so will win the election. And if that so-and-so doesn't win the election, then things will go topsy-turvy. That's an assumption. It's an assumption that foreknowledge equals a predestination. Because for God, he just rules that there will be a group of people who will be capable of ruling the nation. And usually when God predestined, He predestined with plan A, B, C, D, E, F. Five. And then 7,000 more. So that knowing that humans can choose. And so... In the original predestination, there were those who were born with the ruling genes. And then on this earth, as they run the race on this earth, the forerunner becomes Mark by his choice. Then God Mark, based on your choice, you're Mark as candidate number one. And then God starts working in his life forward. And so God predestined, then he marks, then he sees the decisions with foreknowledge. Then only sometimes God did a few things, not everything, based on his foreknowledge. Okay, so based on his foreknowledge, there's no way candidates with starting with B or H or D can win, or even T. Uh, no, because he has to give free view for foreknowledge. Okay. And foreknowledge is why I say a uh, nanosecond after predestination. So they can never win now uh, because of foreknowledge. He has this foreknowledge that they will never We can win. never win against God's foreknowledge. Correct. Okay. okay, secondly, second, so, um, second, can I summarize? So the first point is that foreknowledge trumps predestination. That based on yes. the foreknowledge that's going yes. to happen, it trumps your predestination. Okay, the second point, the second point is um, predestination seems a concept which is a very definite thing, which is like, um, okay, I know you'll get from point A to point B and point, from point B to point C. But then in this world, um, if you look at the world and the inventions in general, they were formulated on the basis of trial and error. That is, no one knows that you have from point A to point B. And, the, and take for instance like the light bulb, when Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, he did a thousand dollar, he did a thousand reiterations before he finally came up with the light bulb. So, and that goes the same for many, many inventions in the world. They were a result of trial and error. 
So, um, yeah, predestination kinds of um, contradicts the notion of trial and error because in this life we are taught that to achieve results we have, we have to experiment with things. But now it seems like we are no longer experimenting. We have given up experimentation and we are going forward to say that, okay, I know that we are moving from point A to point B and this is what I must do. And even the next step from point B to point C, I definitely must do this. I'm not going to, I, I, I don't know, it, does it contradict the notion of try and error. I'm not like saying going to try and error to move from point B to point C. Because whatever happens, we seek the law and the law says go here, we'll go here. There's no try and error involved. Okay. Number one, unlike Thomas Edison and the others, God is perfect. So from perfection, Albert, uh, Thomas Albert, uh, Albert Edison took a long time to discover tungsten as a good filament. Because God is God, He created all things. He looks and says, tungsten is okay. He doesn't need the experiment. So we must remember that when God not only knows our free choice, He knows our nature. It's just like when you know a nature of a dog or an animal, you can train them. Although it makes us look like animals to God, but because I exalt God so high, the one who creates us knows our nature and instinct. Because nature and instinct are the choices we make. Uh, and, uh, like I, I mentioned, you know, remember when I asked Mohan, what's your favorite food? Mohan's answer was uh, his mother's biryani, ra mutton biryani. Right. And then I say, was it a free choice or was you in, were you influenced because you were born in that culture and your mother brought you up with mutton biryani? And uh, so it looks like free choice, but it was, it was the influenced by nurture. And uh, then it, it brought into uh, certain uh, things that he liked and disliked. Because God is God, he has the power to create and make us like robots. But robots have no capacity of free will. So he adds free will. Now, because God both create our ability to exist, and then he gives us the free will, he's in control of both, he knows how we will behave. And based on his knowledge of how we behave, he try not to intervene so that we enjoy maximum freedom. Just like right now. If God had intervened when Satan fell or when Adam fell uh, in such a way that he removed all, got rid of all evil all the time, we will never have what we have the world exists as it is. But... God is more powerful than that and He knows that even in the worst case scenario, He knows how to nudge it back. So what God does is He nudge. He doesn't control. Control is a dictator. God is very democratic. He gave us freedom, free choice. So in democracy, we look at God running this thing as a democracy rather than a, than a dictator. Although He could have run it as a dictator because he has every right. But he runs it at the democracy because democracy gives freedom. Now, what does democracy do? Democracy nudges. If we go too extreme, then the army need to come. If we go extreme into anarchy, where every man law to himself, then a bit of military force needs to come in. Then, but not too much. Too much, then we lose our freedom. Then we have to release the military again and then get more civilians inside. So we move into extremes kind of thing. It's more like God flowing with us, nudging us in the right direction, then dictating it. Okay, so is there still any value for try and error and self-experimentation in this? There is in terms of human. You see, if you've got two things fixed, that is predestination event and individual uh, in the person. If the two are fixed, there's no more free choice. But if one is fixed and the other is fixed but partially flexible, then you have room for, for, for improvement. 
Because this first guy might not be as good as the second guy or the third guy. Or this first guy might only do 90%, 10% somebody else got to do. So there's this variable. In order to have, uh, you have a mixture of both. You have the fix and the variable. The variable is the humans involved. The fix is the direction God wants it to move. So in that way, the experimentation is on the human side rather than on the element side. Okay, next question. Um, you need to open. Uh, from the internet? Ah, yes. Okay. Yeah. Third question. Okay. Uh, Never mind, we hold the question and give everyone a chance. Yeah. Yeah, let's move to the internet one. Internet? Oh, it's there. Okay. Okay, internet. My pre existence, okay. In my pre existence, after I passed the test, the Lord chose me and asked what I wanted, caught off guard. The Father gave. Okay, can we fix that? Okay. The father gave me the answer to say whatever the father wants me to be. Uh, so that is a question? Okay, let me look at the question again. Um, now, I remember the Lord asking Solomon what he wanted. And then Solomon says he wants wisdom. So it was a test and a choice. And I also remember the Lord asked me what I wanted. And I said, I want to be like Jesus. So I give a different answer. And uh, so here he says, uh, in my pre-existence, after I passed the test, pre-existence, that means before you came down, the Lord chose me and asked what I wanted. And the Father gave me an answer to say, whatever the Father wants me to be. Um, there is some level of free choice. Like for example, when Aruel, before he came, he had, we had about five files. Don't know why always the number five. Five files. I remember holding the file. And I told Ariel, okay, this is the first family I choose for you to be born. And then the second family, third family, fourth family. And these are the best families for you to have enough tests and trials to build who you are. Then Ariel said, okay, and he took the first family. So you had a little bit of free choice to come. Some of you might have looked slightly different if you chose your second family or your third family. You might be slightly more hair, less hair slightly darker or whiter uh, if you chose different families. So we had some free choice that side before we came. And then after we came, we still have some free choice because of the delight of the Lord. Uh, remember, free choice is within predestination. And so within predestination, He gives you a bit of room uh, so that you can enjoy. It's, called, it's for our pleasure. Free choice was given for our pleasure. Sorry, so, sorry. So I don't see the question, so I just answer as much as I can. Eh? B is the question. Ah. Okay, okay, one B. After that, the Lord brought me to, okay, to Dr. Johan. Does the Lord ask every chosen person to be born a human this question? If so, do different answers determine a different destiny for them? All right, so this is your question. No, not everyone was given the same type of question or choice. To some, we are given more choices than others depending on the training that is given. And so not everyone has the same liberty, not everyone has the same uh, choice given. Uh, each is uniquely different. And um, then, uh, Dr. Jahan, in predestination, are they multiple choices of soulmates in a sense that if one fails, another takes his or her place. Does Roman 8 apply if they didn't marry your soulmate? All right. Um, usually, there is like first choice, second choice, third choice, fourth choice, fifth choice. And usually, like on this side, okay, now so many is going to illustrate very carefully. So there's first choice, second choice, third choice, fourth choice, fifth choice. This side is first choice, second choice, third, fourth, third choice, fourth choice, from the female side, male and female. So the best is first choice with first choice. But if first choice want to choose first choice, and this first choice say, no way, Jose. So this first choice now has to choose the second choice, right? And uh, then if the second say, no way, Jose, okay, then third choice. And so uh, that is how it works. And of course, this original first choice might take a different choice. Maybe choose someone totally out, or maybe end up with number five. Now this is what happens. After the choice is made, it depends on whose fault and whose mistake it is. Obviously, if, if 
The first choice and the first choice come, this choice did not choose. So this choice is the one who makes a mistake, not this one, right? So this one end up with the second one, or the third one. So let's say this one ends with the second one. You know what God does? He goes back in time, takes the quality of this person and reduce. Reduce. So this person is taken and reduced to the original, to, into second or third choice. And he puts, since this person accept, let's say the second choice, he puts the quality necessary for this, to match this person into number two, and this, this person shoot became number one. Because God can move back in time and put DNA or remove DNA. So if this first choice keeps choosing the wrong way, so this first choice reject first, second, third, fourth, fifth, all reject, totally go their own way and choose a Canaanite, let's say, instead of Israelite. Then all the good things that were originally supposed to come forth, because life is about bringing forth the things of God. So all the good things are totally removed and given to somebody else. This person will become a Canaanite. So our choices change the other side. That's why I show this chart again. We show the other chart just temporarily behind this one. And uh, this affects this. It can have a reverse effect. It can take you from the book of life, obviously. And you can add to your book of life. And it's important to always choose God's choice. When we don't choose God's original choice, and let's say from plan A, you choose, you, from plan B, you reject, plan C, you reject, plan D, you reject, plan E, you reject, you choose plan F. All that was supposed to be for you are removed and you're reduced until you're equal to F. Yes? Uh, Pastor, can I ask one thing? Uh, okay. Uh, okay, just in relation to this before I go back, yes. Yes, then you got the next set of five, until 7,000 more. Oh, okay, okay. So it's not just five, it's seven. Of course. <laughs> and, and it's very unlikely that you'll be rejected by 6,999. <laughs> it cannot be that bad, right? Okay, so, okay. But it seems that God worked with five at a time. Okay, back to the original question. Um, uh, number, number two. I don't think I have number two. This is number three. Oh, I did answer. Okay, number three. When we merge fully with our pre-existent selves and become a part of God in a sense, is it possible we travel back in time and realize we were involved in Genesis 1-1, Genesis 1-3? Yes. In fact, every one of you today were witnesses of the Exodus because you're going to be part of the Exodus. You were there with the angels and spirits watching the exodus taking place. So some of us were there in creation. As part of our training, he takes us back in time. Actually, those occur before you came. Then after you accept your pre-existence, you remember some of those things. He allows you the memories because now the memories will benefit you. Before that, it wouldn't benefit you. I remember when I was young, uh, growing up, uh, during the age before accountability, I always felt I don't belong to this earth. I don't know anyone you felt the same way. I always look out and say, I came from somewhere I don't feel at home on this earth. You know, because you lost all your memories. And, uh, so that feeling was there all the time. And uh, so... Uh, that is possible. Number four, Dr. Johan, in predestination, it looks like some individuals used to follow you around like bodyguards, as I said. No, no, not bodyguards are existent. We don't need bodyguards are existent. Uh, uh, but a group of them were around, okay, learning, learning. And uh, in this age, how are these people relate to your ministry and have some missed the call? Yes. Some have totally missed it. Some are not with me here. Some have parted ways long, long ago. And they could have, been, could have been part of it. And uh, the answer is yes, unfortunately. And uh, in the end, wait till we all go back. And you know when we go back, 
everyone will have a chance to review, to see what your original A was. If you go up as F, you will still be shown A to E. What you could have been. So that you realize that God is a fair God. Because inside you will be something that felt you should have been A. But you end up as an F. So God needs to show you it was your choice. It was not because of God. Yeah. So that's it. Uh, Pastor, I had a brother who came before me, but he died immediately after labor. How do you explain the destiny purpose of children whose earthly lives end like this? Do they come back to earth? Um, no. From the heaven point of view, heaven no more than this earth. Heaven no even the time to the second of when you're going to go home. Every baby conceived, every fetus, they already know when the baby is going to, going to go home. So before they came, they already know they're going to go home first. And not every spirit like to come and live on. Some just want to be part of New Jerusalem, but they know how dangerous. Come, stay in the womb, quickly die, go home. <laughs> no trial, no test. And they learn the rest there. They know it, and that's all they want. Uh, scared. Yeah, they'll be scared. The parent is sad, you know, for the mother? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Of course, they'll be sad. Uh, and, uh, so, that's how some, some, some ends up. Uh, number six. On the same note, what happens to the destinies of children who are deliberately, accidentally miscarried? If God is in God, okay, that we already answered that the spiritual world knows. So the spirit that come are chosen among those that say, hey, uh, is there any room, uh, just uh, six hours on the planet or just uh, three months on the planet? And that's how they qualify. So there are some spirits up there like that and uh, they don't want to come any longer. They just want to be part of the human race and good enough. And uh, so that's all that they wanted. Then uh, seven, in understanding the ascension of Jesus to the Father's glory, what is the significance of his secret appearance of Mary Magdalene prior to the ascension expressed in Revelation 5, New Song and Unsealed Book? Okay, Mary Magdalene was actually one of the closest person to Jesus on earth without any sexual connotation. She was very close to Jesus, which is why don't be surprised that uh, in the Apocrypha and uh, other things, uh, that the other non-Christians are making a fuss of it, and it say that Jesus kissed her. But do you know that the Bible has five verses that show the kiss of holy kiss? You remember that? It's in the Bible. How come we don't practice it? Because cannot. Our cultures forbid it today. But if you were in Russia and you greet one another, remember they were cha cha and then uh, Eskimo rub noses. And that's a bit intimate, intimate, right? The rub noses. Our cultures. Just say Australian culture, you know, sometimes like uh, I remember when we were doing one of the wake, uh, then I think it's Agnesa or something. So when I first saw her, I just wanted to give her a hug because her, she's very sad. Father is just down. So I give a, you know, just a very soft heart, just a comfort thing. It's very Australian. And uh, so, uh, but it might not be in certain cultures. Uh, in India, the husbands and wives also have to sit separate. So our human culture have changed and imposed things on us. And we just flow with the culture today. When they wrote the Bible about Jewish culture, kissing was very normal. Remember, Jacob kissed Rachel the first time he met as strangers in the Bible. And none of the family had any problems with it. It all has to do with culture. And, uh, so we have uh, what we call, where were we? Ah, Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was close to Jesus and in fact, Mary Magdalene had a lot of insights into Jesus, which is why the Dan Brown's book was all about Jesus and Mary Magdalene getting married and producing children, correct? Based on false information, based on uh, 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 all the wrong information that he has. And his, the whole book was about that Jesus has secret children. <laughs> that, was, that was the whole book. And the church was trying to hide it. You know, until they make it like a scandal. 
Uh, no, that's not true. Jesus never married. Jesus, needed, Jesus cannot, should not. Jesus is God. If Jesus ever get married and produced, you know the children won't be human. They didn't think carefully. Right? Jesus was not human. Remember, he was like flesh, but he's not really human. Uh, and uh, he was like Adam. It will be like Adam reproducing. So it won't be sin nature anymore. It sounds sort of a mixture. Uh, so cannot, no, no, no such thing. But uh, Mary Magdalene was one of those who were close to Jesus, whom, remember, Jesus was a man and he needed to confide also the needs. Don't every man feel the need of the feminine side? Don't every female feel the need of the masculine side? Not necessary as husbands and wives. Sometimes platonic relationships. And sometimes even in leadership group. I appreciate women leaders as much as I appreciate men leaders. Because women leaders can see things men leaders cannot see. Don't you agree? And so sometimes you've got a prime minister who is a female. And she can do things sometimes that the, and she could do things more motherly than a male prime minister. Because they, they bring the essence of their being. God made us male and female. So to a certain extent, Mary Magdalene functioned in the role of Jesus' counterpart without any sexual connotation or emotional relationship or any relationship. It was a necessity thing that Jesus had. And in the Apocrypha, which I have read, Jesus was very close to Mary Magdalene. And you'll find that sometimes Mary Magdalene could share some things that only Jesus shared with her that the disciples didn't know. The twelve. Because of the twelve, the three know more than the other nine. Then Mary Magdalene had some privilege that the others didn't have because she somehow found the heart of Jesus. And you'll find in some of the Apocrypha, Jesus even said, he loved her more than the other disciples. She was as a disciple. Of course, the other disciple Jesus' love was claimed by John. And, uh, so, but remember our culture. People can see it wrong that side. Wait till another 10, 20 years when the homosexual culture becomes in, the people will say, Jesus had a homosexual relationship with John the Apostle, which is not true. You see, we color things from our culture, which are not present. So Mary Magdalene was actually one of the leaders of the church and like a counterpart that Jesus has shared many secrets with. And uh, then uh, that is why because of her walk and her love for the Lord, Jesus revealed things to her. And when Jesus showed her uh, the appearance, it was only because, you see, which other disciple felt saddest when Jesus went home? Mary Magdalene. You know why? She loved Jesus slightly more than the others. Well, I can't make the other twelve all shame. Eh? But I will give Mary Magdalene this. She loved Jesus slightly more than the others. All the others went fishing. Mary Magdalene says, no, I miss Jesus so much. I just want to be near him, even in his body. She didn't expect to see a resurrected Jesus. So she had that. You know? Not in a relationship way again, not in a sexual way, but in a human way. Okay, the relationship of Jonathan and David. There was no sin involved. But they really love each other. So much that David even says, that the love that Jonathan had for him was better than women. Because he should not say that. Nah. That was because he, he hasn't really met his soulmate. Nah. Yeah. But you can see that David was never stable because he never really uh, fully found his counterpart. When we humans were split into male and female, we had a vacuum in our lives for a counterpart. And whether that is mad, I could, of course, today some people are called to be single like the Apostle Paul. But do you know the Apostle Paul got some female companions traveling with him? In case you didn't realize that. There was a lady called, start with T, her name. T bar, T, something like that. Uh, in the Apocrypha. And, uh, and she left everything to start up as a disciple of Paul uh, until uh, some of them were thinking that, oh, you know, uh, how can Paul teach until she go off track like that? And 
So there is all this dynamics that we're going on, and uh, because we don't know all the stories that were going on inside. You hear about John Wesley, right? John Wesley's wife was not his soulmate. You can read always, and as a result, John Wesley was always looking to converse with some other people, and uh, so that has always been there, because. Uh, he needed an exchange intellectually to see the other point of view. Uh, we're not justifying any of these things, remember. We're just illustrating and then showing the place of Mary Magdalene in the holy place where God is. Some people are called to be single. But when you're called to be single, or, or some people, you know, they, they didn't meet their soulmates here in their old various relationship, then the best is if you find someone who we could iron sharpen iron, uh, who is the opposite nature or, or leader or that, very good. It will balance you. Uh, especially if they're the opposite gender. Uh, then the dynamics will bring out the best strength in you. Because uh, that is part of the way God created us humans. They are there. Uh, and so that's a place where Mary Magdalene is because Mary Magdalene was actually as close to Jesus as one of the three. But in the days of the Bible, women are very low, correct? So they have to be written separately. In fact, there were other women very close to Jesus. Joanna, Mary, you know what they do? They wash Jesus' clothes. Hey, don't you think Jesus' clothes need to be washed? He said, oh, I thought he didn't need it. No, they took care of Jesus. Everywhere, they took care of him. They looked after him. And they cared for him. And Jesus was okay with that. He flowed with that. Uh, it's mentioned in the book of Luke. That these are the three women who look after Jesus all the time. But just one sentence, you know there's a lot of work? Three years, you know. <laughs> three years looking after him. And they've been following him for three years. But that one sentence was to their credit. And uh, Mary was one of those who looked after Jesus, cared for him. And uh, she brought all the things to take care of the physical body. And she was there crying, and Mary was also there crying. And uh, where was Peter? Oh, looking from far. Where was John? John was there. See, those who loved Jesus kept near. John was nearby, remember? John was looking at Jesus. And he was near enough for Jesus to look at him and look at Mary and says, uh, a woman, thy son. And then he says, you know, to John, thy mother. So they take care of each other. So they were right there. Those who love Jesus, uh, you know how love is, human love. Uh, we can have spiritual love, but no matter how spiritual your love, there will be an element of emotions inside. Because we are human emotion. You just have to draw the line and don't let it cross the physical or the sexual line. That's the most important thing. And so we need to uh, understand where Mary Magdalene stands. So I need to make mention of that uh, because um, uh, we need to balance against the wrong teaching outside uh, that try to make Mary Magdalene something more than what she is not. Uh, and, and all the wrong teachings that have come out about Mary Magdalene that is there. Uh, and so that's uh, something special that God gave to her. And that remain her special revelation. In fact, she got a special reward. In heaven today, she's among the higher up disciples. Wow, I mean, she's really among the higher up disciples. Uh, but the Bible cannot mention it because the Bible was a very uh, uh, patriarchal society. And women were very low. But now that there's neither male nor female, she has found her place very high in God's kingdom. And... Um, and can a person lose salvation by one sin? In other words, a person be forbidden enters him by one unforgiven sin. Depends. If the sin is the sin unto death, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, or the sin of rejecting Jesus. That one sin, enough. Those are the only sins that can lose salvation. I don't see any other sins that lose salvation. Even the woman, with, uh, uh, the woman at the well, she was living in sin. She didn't lose salvation at all. And even the worst case scenario in the Bible of the man who lived with his stepmother, 
Paul even says his spirit is still safe. So he never lost salvation either. But the one sin that can lose salvation, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, sin unto death or rejection of Jesus. That one, good enough, no matter how else everything else finds. Number nine, the angelic and spirit being handed over to mankind in this church age, does it cover all aspects and areas of the six days of creation, spirit, soul and body, and physical areas as we grow into our fullness? The answer is yes. Yes. It is for the human race to be a master of creation. And uh, in the original sense, when God created, everything has to come from God. Then God assigned everything, except that the angels were holding it until the human race reproduced. That's why God actually told Adam and Eve, please reproduce fast. But the actual words were, be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> right? God wanted to produce fast. And in fact, if Adam and Eve had reproduced, it wouldn't have taken a long time. Because in roughly about, roughly in a year, you know in the spirit, in a year you grow fully up. So in a perfect world, in a year you become adult. You grow very fast because that year is like a quantum time year. And you will grow to full age in a year, spiritually. And that's a lot of children he could have produced. And he could have multiplied. But he never did it. He never did it. And as a result, uh, we have the fall of humans. And uh, one day I'll teach on that. And I told the Canadians when they were asking questions. And I say, okay, this topic I will cover in 2019. <laughs> say, what topic? And here I just touch on it a little bit briefly. How do you think Adam and Eve are going to reproduce before they fall? The normal human way, correct? The joining of two humans and the genitals together but in a glorified stage. But because they didn't do it before the fall, they did it after the fall. As a result, sexuality became polluted. And only in Christ is the marriage made sanctified. Do you know in the Old Testament, even whenever the they, husband and wife have a relationship, they must offer sacrifice? called sacrifice of purification. It became polluted. And it takes Christ to come to purify everything. So Christ has to redeem everything back to order. And why this topic is important? Because in the millennium, they're going to reproduce like Adam reproduced. So they need to understand the essence of the beauty that is there that humans being viewed as ugly. And, um, so, uh, I remember when some of the revelations were, were there, uh, that they don't realize some of these things. Everything in the natural has a form in the spiritual first. And in the spiritual, all this, is, isn't all this created by God? It is created by God. And so, there is a holiness to it that we have no idea what it's about but it's very powerful. So I talk about that when I teach the second generation for the millennium. 2019, that remind me to teach that. And, uh, uh, number 10, in the encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, he said that he who drinks of the water, he gives, shall never thirst anymore. But we need to keep coming to him to quench future thirst. Okay, it depends on two things whether we actually drink from the fullness of his water and also on the fact of whether we have thirsted after him in the same way. And once you discover that, that, that you really drink of the Lord Jesus once and enter into it,
Uh, did we get the rest of the other message in? Okay, which point did the batteries die? I oh, just ran out. Okay, I'm glad that we got it all in. Right. Okay, this 10 cents battery is not bad. Eh? 20 cents uh, for the whole day. Yeah. And um, so, the uh, summary are the thirst. Talking about the thirst, most of us did not even drink. You know what we did? We taste. No wonder you take thirst again. If, if you're thirsty and I say, taste some water, will you still be thirsty? Yes. And most of us taste. Do you know in Hebrew chapter 6 is taste? You know, those who are tasted of the powers of the age to come. So you taste. You haven't even eaten. You haven't partaken it. So most of us just taste of Jesus. Then we run away. Instead of drinking. Drinking takes time. Drinking soaks in until the thirst is finished. And so we never did that. That's why we thirst again. And each time we come, we only taste. Very few understood how to stay and drink from our Lord Jesus. Uh, was it, uh, was it 11? Number 11. As we grow into our pre conformity with Jesus, the greater worlds come forth, will we have some form of virgin birth? <laughs> well, I had to look at it twice again. This question is very funny. In these end times, as the anointing increases, Whoa! So one day you're going to come to your husband and say, I have this child, an angel appeared to me. <laughs> no, it will never be. Sorry to say, there's only one virgin birth, it belongs to Mary Magdalene. Because if there are any others, uh, we have to ask, eh? Mary. Oh yeah, Mary, sorry, not Mary Magdalene, sorry. Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, and uh, only one, mother of Mary of Jesus. Because if there is any miraculous birth, I have to ask a question. What special being is coming forth? It will have to be like a third Adam. Correct? Or a third man kind of thing. Since there's no more. Only one belongs to Jesus. Then we have uh, no more virgin birth. So I don't know whether that's good news or bad news for any one of you. <laughs> right. But uh, no, there won't be no, uh, those things. I, I think this question is asked because they say every miracle in the Bible will be repeated. <laughs> so you're wondering, okay, it's another miracle. No, that one exception, only for Jesus. Right. Yeah. Hey? Yeah, yeah the, the first and the last, and no more. And only for our Lord Jesus Christ. And... Um, and uh, 12, 12 question. In Revelation 19, 12 to 16, and, uh, we read of Jesus' new name on his version and tie, which has revealed as Lamb of God. Why tie in the version of forehead? What's the significance of this and how we affected? Now, this is Jesus coming on a white horse. On his tie is the word, word of God. And that's because he permanently remains the word of God. But the word of God is not part of his clothing instead of part of who he is. Who he is, is the Lamb of God. So it shows that the Ancient of Days, being the Ancient of Days, is now a lower category to his tie. But he is actually the Lamb of God. So even the position where the name, yes, correct. The position where the name is written is important. Uh, it's written on his tie. He is the Word of God. So it's just like one aspect of Jesus is the Ancient of Days. Yeah. Wait, we finish this one, uh, unless it's related. Okay, then, 13. What are some of the responsibilities of people who've been in charge of galaxies? So you're really interested, eh? In charge of galaxies, star system, planets. What will happen to black holes? <laughs> you really advance, eh? Okay. Um, those are in charge of those areas are in charge of bringing the presence and the glory of God to those new places and the revelation of God. And it will involve planning with many angels and many humans under you to organize them into a system of worship, revelation, and attributes of God. It's be a heavy responsibility. As far as a, a black holes are is concerned, uh, black holes are actually the space between two uh, sections or dimensions of the galaxy or universe. 
So what we see as stars today is energy coming from the opposite side black hole. And what we see as black hole, opposite side is the star energy going out from that side. And uh, they're just uh, twin aspects of the, of the galaxy and universe that we have. Uh, and, uh, so all this will be revealed when we are trans-dimensional. We can see the whole thing in one piece. So the responsibilities are more in organization and bringing the nature of God to those things and revelation and the energy of God. It's channeling, ch channeling the energy of God to those places. Uh, Pastor, can you clarify the sixth level of holiness? Uh, do female soulmates disappear? Hey, why you ask only female and not male? Eh? Anyway, do female soulmates disappear into the male in order to represent the word in another universe? Huh. Interesting question. Uh, I, would, I won't say just the female disappear. I would say both the male and the female disappear into a union of a being. Remember Adam and Eve before they became two beings? They were one being. And we saw the one being, ten foot tall. Then when he became Adam and Eve, Adam was about seven feet, Eve was six feet. So they split into two beings. And only God could do that. And so when they join back, they become more like the being of God. Uh, God within himself has both male and female attributes, but not in a gender sense like ours. Uh, we have that to only to understand him. Uh, and so uh, I would say not just the female, both disappear. Both disappear. Uh, number 15, there are small island nations not in the known mainlands which happens to... What happens to these islands in the seas? Will they find their way to the pristine areas if they are part of the end time church? If they are. But as far as I know, uh, uh, most of these are all disappear because the sea is rise, rise higher. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, and this, you're looking at geography. God is looking at the human race. The geography of the earth is just background. What God is interested in is human beings. So if there are not many human beings there, God is not so interested. It can be a beautiful island, but no human being there, God is not interested. God is interested in human beings, where the humans are. And we are the ones He's redeeming, not the earth. And the earth has to be burned and renewed. 16. On earth, our bodies are the temple of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. But in Revelation 21, 22, God is the temple. How are the two related? Is it the final stage of Him in us and us in Him? Yes. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit now because God is working His way in us. In New Jerusalem, we are in Him. The other aspect. So both aspects need to be worked at one first, then the other. And that's why we see both. In 17, why, uh, why the three death dimensions, hell, death, and the sea in Revelation 20, 13 to 14? Uh, what body do those who are resurrected under damnation get? Uh, then what changes in our body from the millennium to New Jerusalem era? And uh, remember in the book of uh, 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 chapter Revelation 20 here, it's a spiritual body not a physical body anymore. It's not a body made up of chemicals, calcium and iron, all that. those are very low. It's a spiritual body, but a uh, uh, spiritual type of body that is still feels substance that is there, and that's how everyone is judged. In that state, they are cast into uh, the lake of fire. Uh, and the lake of fire is something that burns, but it's not a fire caused by uh, oxygenation. All fires come from Oxygen combined to the elements. So it's nothing to do with physical anymore. The physical world is actually just a shadow, a path of smoke that just disappeared. The real shape is in a thought energy that is there. So that thought energy has a spirit form, and that's why it's formed there. Uh, but more interesting is uh, the changes in your body from the millennium to New Jerusalem. In the millennium, the body is something like Adam and Eve body, but more glorified because of Christ's nature inside. So the millennium is like Adam and Eve before the fall, for 1,000 years, with the Christ-added element and those who participate in it. 
And then from there, it changed into what I call, for lack of a better word, heavenly type of body. It will be closer to make up from the substance of God. Actually, all of New Jerusalem is made up from the molecules of the throne room. So you know what the molecules of the throne room? Only God's things is there. And so it's like some sort of molecule of God that is creating our new body. So the body that we have in New Jerusalem, New Heaven, New Earth, is different from New Jerusalem. Uh, and different from the millennium. It's a higher level. Uh, and 18. I wonder how could we know whether a person is your soulmate or not. I'm dating. <laughs> but previously, a prophet implying we are not soulmates in a prophecy. Okay, don't rely on anything from the outside. You have to rely on everything on the inside. Because in the end, put it this way, your father and mother is not going to marry the person. Your prophet is not going to marry that person. Your friend is not going to marry that person. It's your life with that person's life. So the ultimate decision is yours to make. And for you to make that decision, you must check in your own evil witness. At the end of the day, you guys ask yourself, now we're talking about soulmates, right? You got to ask, do I want to be with this person for the next one billion years? You're not asking, do I want to be with this person unto death? There's no death. So, you know, or both you're going to be together for billions of years, don't worry about that. <laughs> okay. So, you're wondering, you know, uh, so in the decision making of, of this area, uh, I don't think anyone else should be affected by prophecy or anything. In the end, at the end of the day, you have to check in yourself. Uh, there's this check in, in the cell. And I think, oh, I haven't added a chapter in the soulmate book. I've actually written one extra chapter about identifying your soulmate. So I might just give the points here. Number one, you will be from the same section in heaven. In heaven, light attracts light. So in order to remain at the same level, you have to actually come from the same section. Uh, you won't come from different sections at all, all that. And, and number two, uh, Heavenly soulmates are like twins, more like twins. I know on the earth, marriages have survived of opposites attract. But in the heavenly sense, it's more like twins. That means this is the closest comparison uh, of your nature that is that. Number three, there will be a certain enhancing of spiritual things when the two soulmates that are meant for each other meet. In other words, some spiritual explosion of the good kind uh, that will happen when the two soulmates actually say yes to each other. There will be a spiritual dynamic that comes forth, that is there. Uh, and uh, number, that's the number three, right? Number four, like in all areas, there will also be a test. There will also be a test. So I cannot say that every story is the same. Some stories go through a lot of tests. And then, if as far as I remember, Romeo and Juliet, they never got married, right? Both died. <laughs> okay. So, and, uh, so there are different stories that, and all those things. Some people will have a difficult story, and then they finally make it. You know why? Because, number four, it is a story of love. And love has to be tested in order to be loved. If you're never tested and things are too easy, it cannot be. Because love has to be tested. And number five, only agape love can survive true soulmates. And all the other kinds of love are there, but it will take agape love. And the kind of love that God loves us with, only that can uh, survive and bind it together. And then number six, there will be certain type of, besides the explosion spiritually, there will be certain downloads that started coming because certain things, remember I say, there are some things you can receive on your own. There are some things you can receive as a church in fellowship. Then there are some things only two soulmates can receive when they receive each other. Then you will know. There will be a spiritual dynamic that is added. And of course, number seven, and uh, you would have the favor of God starts coming in. And God himself 
a step in the picture, especially in number seven, the end time. When you find your soulmate whom you supposed to have children with in the millennium, something of the millennium factor will come forth. You know, taste of the powers of the age to come. So some of the millennial factors will come in and uh, could produce certain dynamics that are there. So you got the seven points? Okay, good. And uh, number 20, for people who cannot make it for Washington DC on 4th of July, because of various reasons, does it mean they will not receive the opportunity? Oh no, you can receive it based on the two in uh, the book of uh, numbers, they're outside the camp. They belong to the 70 and they receive the outpouring even when they are there. So I noticed that both you're not going to be there in July, right? Hey? Oh, I missed 19. Ah. Oh, okay. Now let me answer 20 first. Okay. So on this outpouring, you can receive it uh, because you're in the flow. And uh, doesn't matter where you're in geography, but in the spirit, be there. That's it. But as I mentioned, fast for the whole week. Fast for the whole week and be as much in prayer as possible. So 19, I miss out. Okay. If a dating couple are not among the top five soulmate choices, dating couple, no, okay, but they have chosen each other by mistake, huh? <laughs> Would one of them have their predestination reduced and the other one enhanced? No, if both... Wow. <laughs> No, no, yeah. So, I, I, I assume they're not married yet, right? Okay. So, if they're not married yet, of course, uh, uh, I would say that both will be reduced, not just one. Because it both make the choices. So, it depends on that uh, situation that is there. Of course, some people don't like this soulmate doctrine coming in because, you know, a lot of marriages, they say, they look at each other, you know my soulmate, you know, so what to do? Don't divorce. <laughs> no. You live as best as you can. Live as best as you can together because there are many marriages that can that have survived uh, through all those things. Uh, the reason for this soulmate doctrine is actually mainly for the millennium generation. Millennium generation. And also for enhancing of uh, ministry here. Uh, like I've told some of you, right? Like I've told Eddie and Janet, you both are soulmates, so you'll be a long time together. And by the way, both you serving me together even eternity. You know? wow. Praise the Lord. So, long, long thing. Talk about those care, no bodyguard but carrying the bag and all those. You know? So, <laughs> and, uh, so uh, there is a certain destiny that is there. And, um, so, as you know, that uh, Janet, she has the ability to only read my scroll. Yeah, so, most of the time, she gets glimpses of my scroll, my personal scroll, to remind me of different things. Uh, and Eddie has been called to serve alongside armor bearer. So each has a different role for each one. So among the first generation, among the second generation, but the soulmate doctrine is especially designed for the second generation and the third generation. Because these are the people that I have to train. Remember, they are, there's a group that rebel in the millennium. And by the way, I will be in the millennium. And I will be with my soulmate in the millennium, and I will be producing children together with the second millennium, second generation and third generation. In the second and third generation, the training begins here. So I have to train them for the millennium so that their children and their children's 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 children will not be part of the rebellion. We're talking about serious business here. Because there is a rebellion at the end of the millennium. And the millennium is designed in such a way to complete something that God wants to complete. And so we need to look into that. Uh, and that's why we have this teaching that is there. And uh, I've shown that it's in, inside the Bible. You can find it in the Bible. Don't care whether people believe it or not. Right? The main thing is, is it in the Bible? And the Bible does talk about souls being united. The Bible talks about people finding uh, their counterpart uh, and, uh, in terms of uh, Adam and Eve. They are soulmates. They are two halves of each other. So there is sufficient uh, Bible scripture. We finish 20, 21. In the outpouring in Acts 2, there was an audible sign 
of receiving the outpouring of the Spirit, what will be the audible sign? <laughs> sound that someone has received the outpouring of the Spirit come 4th of July? See, this question is based on what I just mentioned. Don't look for the, uh, for the sound. And uh, just make sure you receive what you did. need to receive uh, in that. Like, even before you all go, before it's coming in, some of you receiving interesting signs. Like, Deborah was talking about how you got up this morning, right? Then you check, wasn't there oil all around you? Yes. Half your body full of oil. Yeah, and it's disappeared now, right? Oh, so she discovered oil on her clothes. And all this thing. Yes. And what kind of smell does the oil have? No smell. Okay. So, so these are all little signs that God might give each person differently of some of the things God is preparing to show that you receive some things in your life. But I would say that it will be very tangible. Uh, for me, my, the only thing that I desire, you know, I'm not so much of a, uh, uh, like a whistle and blower kind of thing. I don't look for those things. For me, whatever I receive when I walk out of it is I want to be able to bring uh, perfect healing to DNA situation, grow new arms and legs. To me, that is what I'm looking for. And uh, so you can have a loud sound that come to you, whisper here, you are the outpouring. And then at the end of it, you cannot do signs and wonders. <laughs> so no, the, the best is to be able to absorb the attribute of Jesus and be able to demonstrate power. And uh, for me, power and receiving this will be like God changed my DNA in such a way He can transport me better and He can work DNA healings, grow new arms and new legs, and so that uh, more of his attributes and virtue and power can flow through to create miracle signs and wonders. To me, that is the best. Uh, even if you receive it silently and you don't feel anything, uh, just to, to prepare people, remember Elisha. Did he feel anything when double portion came? None. But he had it. Ah, remember he said, where is the God of Eli Elijah? He actually got it already. But the promise was, if he see Elijah taken, he saw, he got it. And the same way, as long as we're part of it, which is why I want to make sure nobody misses it, I ask everyone, fast on that week. So some of you read fasting before, then you can take a little break that week and then fast again the next week. And, uh, because it's all fasting. Uh, and that particular week of the 4th of July onwards, it is good to be fasting and praying and absorbing and receiving what God has. Whether you feel something or don't feel something, don't worry. Just receive. All I want to make sure is I have been obedient to be exactly what God wants and do what God wants and that's, that's it now. If you're there, you see, it's yours. I think we have covered all. Oh, I've got 22. Did it just appear? Okay. When you are predestined for this move, how will you know that God has added work pages to you? Or if you're already predestined for, for example, Pastor Aaron became the seven thunders prophet. Okay, that was added unto him. Uh, and um, you have to discover your destiny first before you can have addition. And because he was already functioning in that area that God wants him, and then God says, all right, you have this job now, you might as well add this job to you. The, there will be a seven thunders third generation. And there will be a twelve third generation. Because I already saw it. They have to complete. And there will be a four that is third generation. Because they have... You see, the first generation is the foundation. Not bad, you're a foundation. And then the second generation are the walls. Third generation touch on the roofing side. So there's a third generation. 
that is coming forth, that touch on the roofing area, forgot to complete all he needs to complete. The picture and the design of New Jerusalem glory. Okay, so we have another, we need to give to the third service coming. So I'll give another five, ten minutes to answer any remaining questions. Sorry, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't completed my questions from just now. Okay, firstly, right, okay, I'm talking about the, back to the try and error issue, right? Okay, if there's try and error issue, um, the reason why I'm asking about the try and error question is that what is expected of the leadership in the future? If you, because now um, the claim is that we are work, uh, you are working in God's will, and therefore God is perfect, and therefore the implicit assumption is that there will be no try and error. So, for example, take for example, like in the God past... God is perfect, but we are not perfect. Correct, correct, precisely. So, we take for example in the past, like when, um, I, I wouldn't mention his name, he who must not be mentioned, said that, you know, uh, like in the prayer walks, we're supposed to go here and here and here. Okay, fine, that was a mistake. Okay, so, question is, now, no, now it's been re uh, reckoned that some of the prayer walks uh, destinations were a mistake. I mean, he who must not be named when he was here in the past. He said that, right? So, okay. So, what if what if something like that repeats itself? For example, that's just an example. Like, you know, it's a, it's a try and error thing. You know? So, are we, uh, uh, what is our expectations? Are we expected to, like, be like detectives? Uh, like, say, okay, I, I don't know where are you in, uh, where are we going, but let's just follow along and may, guide Lord, uh, may the Lord guide us through. And uh, anything happens, is, uh, it's, it's just a matter of try and error. Basically, we can make mistakes, but ultimately, we arrive at the destination. Okay, that is the first line of thought. The second line of thought is, are we supposed not to make mistakes, and therefore, if you have a trial, or, or therefore, you have an issue, you are not working in God's will, or, you know, you got your prayer I walk destinations wrong, therefore, the implicit assumption is that you are out of God's will. That, that will be okay. a pertinent issue in the prayer. In both these sentences, you got one main assumption. The assumption is that there's only one way of doing things. Yeah. Okay. I mean, now that sorry, is that first, that in assumption. Your first assumption. Yes, but in the yes. trial error, error assumption, there's no one. Way okay. To think now in trial and error, we assume there's what? one one right way and the others are wrong. That's why I call the one right way right and the others are wrong until you find the right way or everything wrong until you find the right way. So the assumption that there's only one way that is correct is also a wrong assumption. Because God gives many ways uh, under free will to do a certain uh, job sometimes. And uh, so I call it the liberty of the man or the woman of God. And then under the liberty of man and woman of God, God can say, right, as long as you do this, you can do it in this manner, or in the other manner, within God's confine. And sometimes God restricts in one way to do it, like the way he, they march around Jericho Wall. There's only one method in which to do it. But in other areas, God gives liberty for them to decide how they want to do it. And uh, so, the answer is basically this. If God never gives a rhema, or a Logos that limits us. Like for example, the Logos tells you there are only two types of altar you can build. An altar of earth or an altar of stones not cut by men. It's limited in the book of Exodus. And the word already limits you. But he gives you two, two choices. So sometimes you've got two choices to build two types of altar and choose one. And then sometimes you've got a rhema that tells you do it this way. And then you got a single choice. But outside of Logos and Rhema, you have multiple choice where God says, just do it, but I give you the liberty how and when you want to do so. So with these three in play, in terms of uh, needing to trial and error, I would say no. Remove the error, trial and trial. That would be the correct perspective. Right, let's move on to the next okay. one. Sorry, can I, can, I ask the, uh, can I ask the last question? You mentioned that we are a series of mathematical formulas. In that case, if we are to be mathematical formulas, right, then I would assume that only a certain formula can produce a certain set of results. Yes. So therefore, so therefore in the case, um, 
I'm just asking, okay, to change this world and in, to be in the exodus, you need to be, say, world shakers, world movers, and world transformers. Well, but then the formula for people changing the world, and even since history in the Bible, has always been, firstly, um, you get a very good set of education, you are either very smart, you are either very powerful, you come from a very rich background, and your family has, you know, and uh, basically that type. Basically, the, the, uh, to, to, to quote you an example, you will be a Rockefeller or a Donald Trump or someone who will change the world. So, people, Not necessarily. People Jesus was born in a manger, but he changed the world. The world. Uh, Jesus, Jesus was, was different. Jesus was God, you see. Correct. And Jesus today will produce more little Jesus. So, you can be born in a manger and change the world. And history also records that not just the rich and the powerful change the world. The world has been changed by people born in poverty or people with a great idea. I agree, I agree. Like, yes. for example, I agree there have been cases like that. But ultimately, by the time they are 35, it will have already been. It will have already uh, been. Remember, you already asked your last question. Yeah. So we, we no, conclude. Because it, it comes as a reiteration to this question. I know. I mean, but here's the, here's the answer. Join the right iteration. That means there are different formulas flowing. And our free choice is to flow into the right iteration of energy that carries you in the right direction. Like for example, you know, I might not know everything. But if I know that that iteration will lead me to that place, then by joining here, it promised me that. And that's good enough. Like the, the long and narrow way, I cannot see every part. And, but there are many long and narrow ways. In fact, if you read the book by any visions uh, by any, which I think Bin Lan has found a source. Those interested, you know, buy the book, contact her. She found a source where they got the book. Uh, inside, it talks about many different types of path God designed. Each path produces different things. So the key is to enter the right iteration and when you finish one look for a different one but look for the end result and you don't need to know all the iterations or the exact formula but by entering the right one you automatically suck in by the flow of the iteration and you know the end results like for example what's the end result of joining this church and being a part of the ministry you know where we're going you know there's only one thing we will help you to fast more pray more Benefit, lose weight. But, uh, and then you know that we want you to know the word, and master the word. So when you join a certain thing, you know what's the end result. You know, that's what we want to produce. What's all our teaching geared for? And, and where? You all know well enough that I have not strived to take the ultimate place. Neither am I a dictator. But I always encourage individual gifts. When some of you individual gifts, I say, come, rise forth, we give you a place. And so that has always been our formula and the thing. Or you join another church. Maybe the church has a culture of a dynasty. Then you know, you can join the church for 20 years, you will still never be a pastor. You will never have a chance to operate the gift of God. Never a chance. You're joining a, a church that wants to plant 10,000 churches. Think about how much employment we need to produce. You're joining a church that has a mandate to win two-thirds of the population of the earth. You're joining a church that believes that one day we will see the signs and wonders of Moses. So you know where we want to end. So by looking at where we want to end, you know the result. But if you join a church that is centered on one leader with one message, then you know the rest of your life you will be followers. And depend on what the leader's message is. If the leader only wants you to prosper, be rich, and give your tithes, then you know you can be in the church for 20 years and you will still be the same. See, it depends on where you... You already know where the end is. And I say the vision is everything. Where is the leader taking us? Isn't that very important? When you work for a company, you know, find, is this company producing drugs? Is this company producing airplanes? Is this company producing? You want to know because even if you're club there, you want to know you're not doing the wrong thing. So what is the company producing? What's the church? What's the angle? We have given our angle. 
Say, this is what we, we do. Why, why didn't I stay in one place, build until like one mega church? That's my normal formula. But God is sending us to different places, opening doors for people and appointing leaders because these are the leaders God wants to use. And that's the direction. So we might not know everything, but know the end result. Get into the flow, and you know that's the end result. What is the aim of the leader? What's the vision of the leader? Which direction we are going? Right. Any last final questions? Yes, you have one waiting for a long time. Oh, we need to hear you online. When you ask, the online need to hear you on the microphone. Yes. Why is Jesus called Lion of Judah? Can you explain? Why Jesus? Called the Lion of Judah. Oh, it is a fulfillment of the prophecy to David. Because David was of the tribe of Judah. And uh, the essence of the Lion of Judah and the essence of being the son of David and the mercies of David and the tabernacle of David is all emphasis on praise and worship that will be what Jesus has come to raise. So on the basis of Mary Magdalene and John the disciple close to Jesus, which level of closeness with him compared most of them? Oh, you mean between John the apostle and Mary Magdalene, you're asking which of them is closer? Yes. Correct. Okay. I would say that on a personal level, Mary Magdalene is closer. On a ministry level, John the Apostle is closer. <laughs> that sounds like an answer from Jesus. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yes. Pastor, when we are taken up in the rapture, where are we taken to? Ah, we are taken to a place uh, at the throne room next to the Father, where the Father is looking over us, uh, near to the place where there is a sea of glass, right at the throne room of God. And we have a celebration of the Lamb's feast. In other words, they're taken to the throne room. Together with those who are in heaven now. Yes. It's we all will gather Jerusalem. together. It's not New Jerusalem. Not yet. New Jerusalem happened after, after the millennium. So we are actually taken. I saw where the feast of the Lamb is taking place. Right in the presence of the Father. In the Panim of the Father. That's a powerful place. No one else can go. So we'll be there for um, till 2070 time dimension? Is that how you see uh, it? Yes, we will be there until Jesus comes down and then we will finish the thing and come down with Him. But before that, it will be mainly training and over when the feast is over. And some of us will start um, to prepare. But we'll be there until Jesus' second coming to the earth. So the rapture, feast of the Lamb, then coming of Jesus. While the earth has 1,260 days under Enoch and Elijah. Roughly about three and a half years. Praise the Lord. Uh, we got most of your at least questions answered and uh, uh, we pray that each one of us continue to grow uh, the benefit in the things that God has for us uh, and uh, over the next uh, next week is broadcasting from UK then there will be just eight Sundays right two months July August eight or nine Sundays okay so you count down the Sundays uh, we'll be broadcasting for US and I'll be still preaching an all-night prayer, but my, our all-night in USA is your Saturday morning. So uh, 10, 11 p.m. there is about 10, uh, 11 a.m. here on Saturday. Uh, and, uh, so, but I'm still preaching there. It will be on live stream. If you want to catch it, you can catch it later. So, and I will talk with Israel about whether we need a Bible study or not. But all the messages of 4th July will be broadcast. 
So we broadcast on 4th of July so that those of you uh, can follow along. Uh, we look forward to those of you who can't go, just be in fasting and prayer. And when you're part of the broadcast, you know, you receive the same thing uh, and uh, allow the Lord uh, to work. So let's go to God in prayer and commit ourselves to Him. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and all that you're doing in each one of our lives. Like the Bible says, who are we and what are we? We are all nothing. John 15 verse 3 says, we can do nothing without Jesus. We were just created to be all that you want us to be. And for us, there's nothing to boast. There's nothing to glory. Because what we are came from you. And we understand, Father, that the moment we are separated from you, then we will become evil. For there's no good that can exist except God. For only God is good. So we ask, so God, that you continue to humble each one of us to take the place of the servant. That despite discussing all these wonderful, beautiful and great things of the Lord, at the end of the day, the greatest among us must be the servant of all. So we ask, O God, that you teach us servanthood, teach us humility, so that we can serve one another. For the greatest in heaven and the highest place in heaven is the ability to serve all others, just like Jesus, our Master and our Lord. Though he is King of kings, Lord of lords, is become a servant to all of us. We are unworthy of His greatness, but You have made us worthy by the blood of the Lamb. So Father, we ask that You put inside each one of us not the spirit of glorification, although You will glorify us, not the spirit that will cause us to triumph over one another, but the spirit of humility, a spirit of meekness, a spirit of servanthood so that we all can become servants of our true and our living God. So make us servants, Father, in you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Give you a good clap offering. God bless you.